The name of this video is uh, Parallel Plate Capacitor. Force isolated case one, that is, in other words, this is an example of how to use the theory, the first part of the theory we developed in the previous two videos on this concept of force on conductors. For the case, very important, of a parallel plate capacitor. So let's sketch our parallel plate capacitor. So I remind you that isolated means that is the charge of the potential that will be constant, the charge, okay? So the way we do it, we have the first plate of our capacitor like this here. And how do we make it isolated? You can think about this in the meantime. Let me this sketch. How do I prepare such a system to be actually isolated? The distance between these two plates Let us call it capital D. Usually we call it small d. It is better to call it capital D because not to confuse it with the small d of differential. The area of one of these two plates, let's call it capital A, in such a way that the square root of capital A, that is the linear dimension of these plates, which are parallel to each other, is much larger then capital D, so we can assume, we can uh, assume the, all, all the results of a two infinite plane of charge, basically, and all the symmetries of two infinite planes, which is nice. Because of that, if we choose the origin of a z-axis to be in the center of this plate, and this is my z-axis, the electric field between these two plates will be directed between the plates, along the z-axis, this is E, only with the z-component, and similarly, the only force which I can have between this plate is also only along the z-axis, so we only bother with dz, because it can only be along the z-axis, because of the symmetry of this problem, obviously. What is the capacitance of uh, such a device? Do you remember what that is? Well, I remind you here that the capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor, as we saw in 242, is epsilon naught proportional to the area divided by the distance capital D between the two plates. Okay, so it gets larger and larger with A. In addition, since these plates are very large, we can also assume a uniform, a sigma, which is given by the total charge Q on this plate divided by A, where the left plate is charged positively with the charge Q and the right plate negatively with, with the charge minus Q. It has to be a balance with opposite charges system of conductors, otherwise it's not a capacitor, plus Q minus Q. Great. So these are all our definitions that we need. In order to prepare the system in an isolated configuration, first we connect it to a battery to charge it with plus Q and minus Q respectively, and then at that point we disconnect the battery and don't allow the plates to touch each other. So they are globally and locally isolated. Case one in the previous videos about the force of conductors. This is the displacement, which I want to move the second plate off with respect to this position here. So I move this whole plate by a quantity dz, let's say, to the right, which is the positive direction along the z-axis. So this is my, these are my two plates. I move this one by a dz from here to here, from here to here by a dz. So now we want to find the force Fz, the amplitude, the magnitude of this force, which again is only along the z-axis, after displacing the second wall by a quantity dz. Okay? So this force, I write it down here, Fz, the magnitude along the z-direction, 
we found it in the first video of this series about the force on conductors. It's given by minus, minus in the case of isolated systems. The partial derivative in this case becomes a simple total derivative. And why is that? Because we only have a, fa a force function of z. So it's total derivative with respect to dz. And now I want you to pause this video and think about what electric energy you want to put here as the argument of this derivative. You have two choices, one half capital C, which is the capacitance of this object, of this parallel plate capacitor, times delta V quantity square, one half C delta V square, or as we have seen in the previous video, there is another way to write the electrostatic energy associated with the parallel plate capacitor, which is Q square divided by 2C. Which one would you choose for an isolated system? Now, if you thought about this a little bit, you should have realized that the correct choice is Q squared divided by 2 capital C, the capacitance. And why is that? Because we are considering an isolated system where the quantity which remains constant is the charge of the system, not the potential, the charge. In the case of potential, we would use 1 half C delta V squared. So instead of 1 half C delta V squared, in this case, we are going to use Q, the constant quantity, squared, divided by 2 times capital C. And here again is the beauty of this set of problems we're investigating on force on conductors. Q and V are the two possible canonical variables you can use when you write the energy and eventually Hamiltonian of a circuit. Okay? In this case, isolated system, the variable, the most suitable variable is Q, the charge, which is constant. With this in mind now, what happens to the capacitance C? Does that remain constant? Well, remember the physics of this problem. We are displacing this wall by a quantity dz, which means we are changing the spacing between the two walls. Therefore, the capacitance must change. By what amount? By a small amount, because I'm displacing the second wall only by a dz. So there should be a dc, C capacitance, change in capacitance. And so before going there, though, let's reshape a little bit this equation in the following fashion. The magnitude of Fz, I take this dz on the, right on the left hand side, times dz is equal to minus isolated system, the differential of q squared over 2c. q is constant, 2 of course is constant, so I obtain q constant quantity squared divided by 2 and C, but C varies. It's the only thing which can vary, the only variable that can vary here. So it's the, the differential of 1 over C, the capacitance. What is the differential of 1 over C, C minus 1? So I pick up another minus sign from C minus 1, so I obtain a plus. C minus 1 minus 1 is C minus 2, so it's 1 over C squared. Q squared divided by 2 times capital C squared dc, because it's a differential, not a derivative, so we need to not to forget about this dc, which is the little variation of capacitance we obtain from going from here at distance capital D between the two plates, d plus dz is this dc. What is this dc? In order to compute it, let us use Taylor series again. And so the way we do that, we define a generic function c, capacitance, function of z, for an arbitrary distance z between the two plates. So this will be epsilon naught times A, capital A, the area of the plates divided by Z. Great. Let us now use Taylor series in order to find C at Z, at D, at D equals Z, so D, capital D, plus DZ. That is, we want to find the capacitance after we displace the second plate by dz with respect to capital D. So C at D plus dz. Okay? What is C at D plus dz? And again, capital D and small d, not to confuse them, approximately equal, because I'm going to stop at first order, is C at capital D, the original value, which we already know, it's given by epsilon A over D, plus Taylor series, 1 over 1 factorial, C prime, which is the first derivative, computed at capital D times dz, which is the little displacement here. This quantity happens to be equal to epsilon naught capital A divided by capital D, which is 
exactly this value here, the base value, minus, and why minus? Because we are deriving epsilon a over z, so it's z minus 1, so it's minus epsilon a over z, z power of minus 2, so it's z squared, so it's minus, minus from the derivative, epsilon naught, capital A, divided by capital D, because we want to compute this derivative, by capital D squared, the whole quantity times dz. And so we find, eventually, that my d capital C is nothing but minus epsilon naught a capital divided by d capital square dz. This is my dc, okay, from Taylor series, because basically the small variation is whatever is on top of the base value, which is the one we have here when the displacement is just capital D, the distance between the two plates. Great. So now with that in mind, we can substitute back this in here and find that fz times dz is going to be equal to q squared over 2c squared dc, which is minus epsilon naught times a over d squared dz. Clearly dz goes away because we have it on both sides of this equality. We can get rid of that. In addition now, we can make use of the definition of capacitance as defined here. Note, however, that the capacitance happens to be in the denominator and squared. So we need to invert and square it. Therefore, we obtain minus Q squared half, 1 over C squared, which is going to be D squared in the numerator, I'm inverting a square in the capacitance, D squared, divided by epsilon naught squared A squared. So D squared up, epsilon squared A squared down, perfect. So we took care of all that, the minus is already there. Epsilon naught, A over D squared. So clearly, this square and this square go away. We get rid of this a and one of this a. We get rid of epsilon naught and one of this epsilon naught. So the final result down here is that fz is equal to minus, it's negative, because it opposes with respect to displacement, which goes to the right. So it's opposed. That's why there is this minus sign. Intuitively and physically, it does make sense qualitatively. So then we have. Here, we need to make another little trick. What is the other little trick? We know that sigma is q over a. So let us multiply and divide all these two equations by a. So that this q squared and this a times a, remember this is only one a because we got rid of this square. So q squared over a squared is actually sigma squared. So we take minus, which intuitively, physically makes sense, minus sigma squared, q squared over a squared, which is sigma squared in the numerator. two in the denominator, epsilon naught in the denominator. So this we have it, this we have it, this we is gone, epsilon naught we have it, this a we took into account for q squared, this is gone, and there is an extra a up here. Typically, however, people prefer to write down, to refer to normalize this fz with respect to the plate area, capital A, Therefore, obtaining a normalized result, which is negative sigma squared divided by 2 times epsilon naught. This is the result we intended to find in this video. The z component of the force normalized between the two plates of this capacitor, once we displace the capacitor, normalized over in the isolated case is minus sigma squared, the surface density, which we assume uniform, Assume that this condition here divided by 2 epsilon naught minus sigma square over 2 epsilon naught, which again is negative as expected qualitatively. To summarize this video, we wanted to find, to use the theory of forces in conductors in the case of a system of two conductors only, a parallel plate capacitor, ideal conditions, so very large plates. We know the capacitance, we know the sigma in this case. We use 
We assume that this isolated this system, so we use this equation down here. The key thing is that we need to use the for the energy, the one which is q squared over 2c instead of 1 half c delta v squared. Q, because isolated means q is constant. So we want to use that. C varies. When we differentiate, when we do the differentiation here, we get a dc. In order to get that, we need to do this Taylor series, which is the key of this problem. Substitute it back in, we get a few simplifications. We then need to multiply and divide by a so that we get sigma squared here, and we get this result. Do we expect this result to be the same or different? Different if we assume an open system, that is, in the open system, we maintain a battery at all times connected to these plates and then displays. Do, we, do you think we will get the same result or a different result? This is the argument of the next video. That's it.